Professora Cláudia, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the second Latin American Caribbean data, scientific data management workshop. We have a very exciting two mornings of lots of discussions on good practices, on scientific data management. And my name is Claudia Bowser Medeiros. I am a part of the uh, scientific committee of FAPESP science and data science research program, but I'm also a member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, and I'm a member of the councils of the Research Data Alliance and the World Data System. And the four of them, FAPESP, Academy of Sciences, World Data System, and Research Data Management, we are co-hosting this event. Um, without much ado, let me start the official opening by introducing uh, Professor Luis Davidovich, the president of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. Professor Davidovich, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to greet all the participants of this uh, fantastic workshop in the name of Professor Claudia Bowser Medeiros and also in the name of Professor Elena Nader, Vice President of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, who will be attending this session, representing the board of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, since unfortunately I'll have to leave after this opening session, I have another commitment. It is a honor for the Brazilian Academy of Sciences to be one of the organizers of the second Latin American Caribbean workshop on scientific data manage management, together with the World Data System, the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, FAPESP, and the Research Data Alliance. On April 2018, the Brazilian Academy of Sciences hosted, in a partnership with the World Data System, the Latin America and the Caribbean Scientific Management Workshop. This event brought together more than 150 participants, being these researchers members of the World Data System Scientific Committee, representatives of the Research Data Alliance, and policymaking and funding institutions. As a result of the workshop, the Brazilian Academy of Sciences established a working group to elaborate norms and guidelines on the treatment of open data for science and technology in Brazil. Then on August 2020, this working group launched the document Open Data and Scientific Data Management, Challenges for Brazilian Science. The uh, working group is now working on a new document, focusing on open science to be launched in 2021. In parallel, the Brazilian Academy of Sciences actively participated in the draft of the UNESCO recommendation on open science. Professor Claudia Bowser Medeiros, who chairs the Brazilian Academy of Sciences working group, also chaired the Inter-Academy panel working group responsible for drafting the IAP response to UNESCO's request for input into their recommendations on open science. Professor Medeiros has been a champion in this area, helping increase the awareness of the scientific community on the challenges of open science. Her contribution is not limited only to Brazil as she has been serving as a member of the scientific committee of the World Data System since April 2020. Thank you very much, Claudia, for your excellent work. I wish you all a productive and fruitful discussion on this theme, which is, of course, of fundamental importance for the world nowadays. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis, for your very, very kind words and advertisement. And, um, and I'm very glad that you could tell us a little bit more about uh, 
the academy's deep involvement in, in the data sharing as a scientific endeavor. And now I'd like to invite Hilary Hennehu, Secretary General of the Research Data Alliance, to tell us a little bit about it and welcome all of you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Um, so I hope you can all hear me well, and I will talk a little bit more about the Research Data Alliance afterwards. But now I would like to join uh, Professor uh, Davidovich in welcoming you all here. We believe there is a, a huge number of people connected to the event, and it's a true uh, honor and pleasure to be here with you all, virtually, unfortunately, but uh, still together nonetheless. Um, the Research Data Alliance, of course, as a bottom-up or um, community-driven organization working around these uh, principles of open science and open research and fair data uh, and scientific data management is very pleased to be hosting uh, together with uh, WDS, with the IFAPESP and uh, the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. Uh, we, uh, of course, are very honoured also to have Claudia, Professora Claudia, as a long-standing member of the RDA Council. Uh, we have nine elected members from across the globe. You'll hear from another member, Ingrid, uh, afterwards, so we're well represented today. But without their support, um, we would not be uh, where we are today, eight years on, with a hugely vibrant international global community that uh, works all very hard together in a volunteer and bottom-up way, which is very important, and a very open and transparent way to develop and implement, and then of course to use all the different solutions um, around uh, research data that we require and need today, and which I hope and I believe very strongly that we all saw the absolute um, essential and fundamental need for uh, data and all the solutions around it to be more open and more available, um, unfortunately, due to the pandemic in which we are all globally living in. Ingrid will give some more insights into how we um, managed and tackled a little bit that with the community that we have. But I think I'll pass the floor back and um, because all roads, as you can tell, lead to Professora Claudia. So I will uh, speak to you all later on. Thank you, Hilary, and uh, see you soon in about three minutes, right? <laughs> and now I have the honor of inviting Alex de Sherbinen, who represents the World Data System, to give us a few welcoming words because he's going to speak right after in a panel. Right. Hi, Alex. Hi, Claudia. Thank you for the welcome. And um, I'm just reminded of our uh, first conference in 2018 in April when we all convened together at the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. And um, it was a tremendously stimulating program. Uh, we had uh, uh, very well, great attendance from all over Latin America. And um, so that was a, a wonderful precedent for what we're going to engage in over the next today and on the 24th of February. Um, unfortunately, of course, we had to cancel the conference in 2020, which I know you, you know, put quite a bit of work into organizing. I'm so delighted that we're able to recoup some of that uh, effort and actually be together during the next uh, two hours here. And um, I just wanted to say right up front that WDS is a membership organization. We're uh, part of the International Science Council. And one of our goals in, in organizing, co-organizing these workshops is to encourage Latin American data repositories to become members of WDS. So on the 24th of February, we will be having a workshop on the Core Trust Seal certification, which is one of the uh, steps towards becoming a member of WDS. In any case, thank you again, Claudia, and thank you all for uh, your efforts in organizing this, uh, what I'm sure will be a very stimulating conference. Over to you. Thank you very much, Alex, and I'm going to see you again in, in three seconds, more or less. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Professor Luis Mello, FAPES Scientific Director, is having problems with his connection. So I'd like to invite Professor 
Roberto Cesar from FAPESP's um, uh, program on e-science and data science to say a few welcoming words on behalf of FAPESP. Roberto, please, uh, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for this uh, invitation. I would like to welcome on behalf of FAPESP uh, everybody for this event. Unfortunately, the scientific director had some problems, connect connection problems, but probably he'll be joining us uh, during the event. FAPESP has been paying lots of attention in all topics that are related to this event for many, many years. So uh, it's, and we are quite proud about the participation that both FAPESP and the researchers in the state of Sao Paulo have on contribution to such, uh, such a team. Just to give an idea, something that we'd like to remember, uh, it's impossible to share and to, to do management of data without the internet. And the first bits that arrived in South America uh, when the internet was created, they arrived actually in the very building of FAPESP. So FAPESP has been paying kind of pioneering attention to this kind of uh, topic for many, many years now. And for us, it's really a kind of uh, very nice to see everything that we reached up to now and all the challenges we have in front of us. And we are quite motivated to, uh, to face those challenges and to continue our successful results. I would like to thank everybody that is attending, everybody that is presenting, the panelists, et cetera, because without you, of course, the event would not be possible. Thanks a lot, Claudia, and uh, let's move for the next steps. Okay, thank you, Roberto. And um, now we are going to start with the presentations uh, proper. And um, I'd like just to tell the audience, we have about uh, 600 uh, people. Oh, Professor Luis Mello just arrived. So, um, good morning, uh, Professor Mello. How are you? Uh, Roberto Cesar just welcomed everybody on behalf of FAPES, but perhaps you'd like to say a few additional words because you have a bad connection. So could, could you try it? Sure. Uh, my First, my apologies for uh, being uh, late. I had uh, some uh, difficulties with uh, my connection. And thank you, Claudia, for organizing this uh, second Latin America and Caribbean scientific data management or workshop. FAPESP uh, is one of the pioneers in open science initiatives in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we have uh, begun Cielo about uh, 30 years ago. As uh, you all know, sharing of scientific data is an important element of open science, and it is actively, actively promoted by FAPESP through policies and norms as a means of accelerating knowledge discovery and leveraging collaboration in research. Uh, to that end, FAPESP is the first funding agency in South America to require data management plans from all project submissions, which in turn is increasing awareness in the researcher community about the relevance of data sharing as a part of good scientific practices. We are very happy to host this event together with the Brazilian Academy of Sciences and two of the most important organizations in the world uh, that promote and coordinate data sharing initiatives. There are over 600 people who have registered from all, all over Latin America, but also from Europe and North America, showing the timeliness and importance of this topic. I wish uh, us all uh, a great event. And once again, thank you, Claudia. Thank you very much. And I hope your connection gets better along the day. So now uh, I'll go and just provide the very short instructions or uh, information to the YouTube audience. Please send your questions by email to the email address e-science 
at fapesp.br. As you see here on the screen, and uh, Professor Roberto Cesar and I will receive these messages and, and, and uh, read these questions to the experts that are going to speak. So, and the, this is the only information about those who want to ask questions by email, please. And if by any chance a message cannot be answered live, I promise, we promise to contact whoever asked the question and answer afterwards, okay? No question will remain unanswered. And uh, so let's now uh, go to the first panel in which Hilary Hennehoe and Alex de Sherbinen are going to give very brief overviews of RDA and WDS. And they are brief because we're going to learn much more of RDA and WDS today and also on the 24th, which is the second half of this workshop. So Hillary, back to you to tell us lots of exciting things about RDA. Thank you, Claudia. Maybe it doesn't want to go on my screen. Uh, okay, as you said, very brief, very brief. So I will keep it uh, as brief as I can. Right. So the, as I said before, the Research Data Alliance is um, was set up uh, in 2013, launched, and with a very grand and ambitious vision of researchers and innovators openly sharing and reusing data across technologies and disciplines and countries you know, to address the grand challenges of society. So, you know, that you could share and reuse data anytime, anywhere, uh, using any technology in the world. So very ambitious, but a very pragmatic uh, mission to accompany that vision of building the social and the technical bridges to enable that. So you think about the little bricks uh, to make the bridges and all the infrastructure that goes around it. Um, we do everything that the Research Data Alliance does, and we have a huge community of over 11,000 data practitioners and domain experts across the globe. So I think you can truly say RDA is global with 146 uh, countries represented. But every choice that we make from a strategic perspective, but also all the work that the community itself does, is based on these fundamental principles of openness of consensus, that everything is inclusive, that there's harmonization, that it is community driven and non-profit and technology neutral. So basically everything that is done, every activity that RDA produces, all the outputs that are done by the community are fully available and done with this, this spirit, which is very important. And very quickly, how is that done? Well, we have three main mechanisms. I won't go into the details, but working groups are very specific. They produce, um, act, uh, if you like, deliverables. Uh, we call them recommendations in RDA, but they're very concrete outputs. They can be standards, they can be tools, they can be code, they can be APIs, things like that. And they have a short time line. Then there are interest groups which work on much bigger, if you like, uh, activities, broader discussion areas, and often uh, set up uh, working groups of uh, to deal and to find the actual specific solution that is uh, being tackled. But they also produce some very important guidelines and best practices and things as well. And then now we have from this year a new grouping, which are communities of practice. Uh, which are much, much broader, rather large, uh, if you like, collaborative groups looking around domain and disciplinary areas. And um, I think this, so this is really how the community works. Uh, anyone comes along, they get involved, you join RDA and you get involved in, in one of these and follow the activities of these groups. I want to give you one pragmatic example. Um, Ingrid will talk about the COVID activity, which was quite significant, but a very good example of how the Research Data Alliance works across disciplines within dis domains and things like that is the agricultural data. It's also close to uh, 
the heart in, of Brazil as well, because it's uh, one of the drivers of, uh, of the uh, agricultural data interest group in RDA is actually based in Brazil. Um, but they set up right at the very beginning of RDA and have now over 260 members. And the concept here is that they represent all the stakeholders in managing data for both food and agricultural research. And in, you know, and innovation, of course, to try and produce an aggregation that are consuming data. No, and it's a, a forum for sharing these experiences and providing visibility to the research and the work in those two areas of food and agricultural data. And of course, a space for networking and offering the uh, community an opportunity to exchange, learn from each other, but also, as I said before, to create specific working groups. And very quickly, we have three uh, examples, of course, there, all of this is available in on the uh, RDA website, but just to give you a, a sort of a sample of the type of outputs that come into uh, from these activities are, uh, so one of them is a, an, an output, as we would call it, for 39 hints to facilitate the use of semantics for data uh, on agriculture, or the wheat data interoperability uh, guidelines. And then a lovely story that I often tell is how RDA, many of the outputs from the agricultural data, supported the open science policy that was implemented in the French uh, research, uh, uh, National Research Agency for, for agricultural data. So, and as you can see, uh, the interest group on agricultural data is, is supported and driven as well by uh, Godin, FAO, FAO and uh, Syngenta and many other uh, large stakeholders. So that's just one example, if you like, of how uh, the community gets together and works in RDA. And it's very easy to join. As I said, we've almost 11,500 men members. Now, registration is free, uh, joining is free, and is open to all, as long as you abide by and adhere to our guiding principles, of course. There is actually a, uh, an area for the community in Brazil, and if you are a member, you can join that up. So I'm sure the slides will be shared afterwards and you can connect to it, but it might be useful because, of course, we try also to facilitate things in local languages and not just uh, in English, unfortunately. And we, how does the, work, the, the community work? Well, of course, we've always been a virtual organization, but we did have wonderful six monthly meetings, plenary meetings, working meetings. Uh, sadly, we were not able to gather in Costa Rica in November last year, so we had ran an online event. And we will continue with our new virtual trend in Edinburgh uh, next year. And that's an opportunity to get involved, join the meetings, join the groups um, and uh, if, uh, see what RDA does and contribute to it, of course. Um, my, uh, I'm just finishing now, but of course, my, uh, Alex, who will speak after me from the World Data System, RDA and the World Data System have a long-standing and wonderful collaboration. Um, and one of the things that we, of the many things we collaborate on is the organization of a lar very, very large event called International Data Week. This will be our third edition. And it, we hope it will take place in Seoul in November. But if it doesn't, if we're not able to do physical uh, meeting, of course, it will be fully virtual and we will have a, a, a hybrid uh, possibility anyway, if there is a physical event. So these are great opportunities to get involved in RDA and to participate. And it's a very welcoming and open community. And I think I'd like to say that RDA is, you know, we do contribute significantly, or well, the community does. I'm very proud to be able to represent this community and they do all the work uh, to achieving the open science and the open research vision in a very uh, generous way. It does, of course, reduce the duplication of efforts. And it offers and generates this open and available community-based solutions and best practices, which are fundamental that we share and so others can reuse and uh, implement. Of course, there's also the network aspect. So we said social and technical bridges. There's a huge social aspect to RDA um, and that continues uh, virtually online. So there's a very large pool of data practitioners there working and willing to share and interact. And it is recognized um, uh, as one of the international, you know, multi-stakeholder, multidisciplinary cohort enabling global fair data. And as I said, it's a volunteer and bottom-up effort, which synchronizes very, very well with many other organizations, but particularly with WDS. 
So with that, I will pass the floor back to Professora Claudia, and then Alex, I'm sure, will tell us more about WDS. So, obrigado. Obrigada, Hilary, and uh, uh, I hope that everybody at the end of this event will run away and become a member of RDA after you're convincing us that this is great and wonderful, and it helps science throughout the world. I'd like now to give the word to Alex to tell us a little bit about WDS. Thank you, Claudia. Um, hopefully this will just have to set this up properly. Okay, so I believe you're seeing my screen now, hopefully. Um, so welcome all and uh, thank you for this opportunity. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I serve as chair uh, until June of 2021 of the WDS Scientific Committee. I also am a deputy manager of a regular member of WDS called the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center. We're based at Columbia University, where I also serve as a senior research scientist and an associate director. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm just gonna launch right in, in the interest of time, um, to give you a little background on what WDS is and, and also a bit of why we're here. Uh, so the vision of the, of the ISC overall is to have a science. So you know, you know, I think I mentioned in my introduction earlier that WDS is, a, is a, a, an operational arm of the International Science Council, which used to be called ICSU. And so the council overall wants to see science as a global public good. They want to see the, the data and knowledge and expertise be universally accessible and universally shared, and they want the practice of science to be inclusive and equitable. Uh, so WDS, along with one of the other data arms of ISC, CodeData, uh, plays a very important role in that. So our goals as WDS are to, uh, to fulfill part of that mandate that ISC has, which is to ensure universal and equitable access to quality assured scientific data. Uh, we want to assure long-term data stewardship in domain-specific repositories. Uh, we want to foster compliance with agreed data standards and conventions, and we want to provide mechanisms to facilitate and improve access to data and data products. Um, so we have established these data sharing principles. There's a lot of text here, but the gist is basically that we encourage in, in all instances and in, in, in that all data repositories and all data organizations to fully and openly share their data. Now we understand that there are circumstances under which sharing of data are not is not possible because of either ethical reasons or perhaps because of legal reasons. But in all other instances, we encourage open and uh, fully free access to data. Uh, data should not be sold unless uh, there is a requirement for cost recovery. Um, and that should be, you know, uh, a minimal, minimal amount of, of fees, uh, if any at all, uh, and should be available with minimal time delay. Obviously, in the era of the internet, these issues are becoming less and less uh, of a problem, but uh, there, there are some parts of the world still where data are, um, let's say, a commodity and considered to be valuable and therefore uh, charged for. Um, we want to uh, basically ensure that data are authentic, high quality, and that the data uh, have high integrity. And so we, part of the purpose of, of WDS is to certify repositories that um, basically uh, adhere to certain minimum standards. And we'll be talking more about that in a moment. And data should be labeled sensitive or restricted only with the appropriate justification. Um, our strategic goals up until 2023, we've recently been through a strategic planning process to sort of update this plan. Uh, but uh, for, for now, I think I'll just stick with what's in, in this document, which is a focus on trust and uh, on quality of open scientific data services, um, a nurturing disciplinary and multidisciplinary scientific data service communities and making trusted data services an integral part of the international scientific, collaborative scientific research pro uh, program, uh, along with RDA and other groups that are out there working in a similar domain. 
I'll be talking a little bit more about our ITO or International Technology Office in a moment, and they're, they're really at the forefront of many of these efforts. Uh, we have a very distinguished group of scientists and data stewards on our uh, scientific committee. In fact, I'll just mention that we'll be soon calling for new membership. Uh, so uh, you need to be nominated by an, inter uh, by an organization that's a member of ISC. And so uh, be aware of that and, and sign up for our newsletters and check our website in case you're interested in becoming potentially a member of the scientific committee. Um, so we have an international program office, Rory Edmonds, who's on this um, at this conference now in Japan, uh, quite late in the evening uh, on his time, uh, is our executive director of that international program office. Uh, they coordinate all operations of WDS. Um, they're responsible for implementing the decisions that we take as a scientific committee. And they organize, uh, he and his team organizes the biannual meetings and WDS events. And he performs many outreach and promotional activities at conferences around the world. Of course, it's largely pre-COVID, but of course now a lot of those events are taking place um, um, online. We recently had a members forum in September, which was very successful. Uh, and engage quite a number of our members. Uh, currently it's hosted, the IPO is a hosted by NICT in Japan. That is until the end of March this year. Uh, we're very pleased to announce that uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratories in the University of Tennessee's Oak Ridge Institute. So this is a, a jointly sponsored institute at, um, it's administratively part of the University of Tennessee in, in Knoxville, has been chosen to be the new IPO host um, as of April 1st, 2021. And we're in the process of signing an MOU with ORI. Um, the International Technology Office uh, has as its primary goal to contribute to the global research data infrastructure. Uh, I will be describing in a bit more detail some of its actual work program. Karen Payne is its director and it's based at Ocean Networks Canada at the University of Victoria. Um, one of the things that uh, Karen has been working on very, uh, very much along with some of our scientific committee members is uh, to, um, uh, you know, develop a harvestable metadata services. Uh, you'll notice that at the bottom there's some Spanish text for those of you who uh, are Spanish speakers. Um, I know that most of, you, most of you on the line are probably Portuguese speakers. But uh, you can make that out, and uh, we have a, a working group that's that's uh, directed by Alicia Urquidi Diaz, who will be um, happy to answer any questions you have on harvestable metadata. These are da metadata that can then be uh, brought into DataCite and other uh, aggregators. Uh, we're working uh, with our members on schema.org, which is a mechanism for marking up your metadata in a way that makes them more accessible to Google's um, uh, data set search. Some of you may have already tried that data set search. Uh, we, there's a sense that uh, just as people search for flights and search uh, for the scholarly literature on Google, that more and more people will be searching for data through Google's data set search tool. Uh, and so we're preparing our members for that so that their data show up in Google data set searches. Uh, we're also working with RDA on this Global Open Research Commons uh, benchmarking working group. And Karen, along with Mark Leggett, are co-chairs of that effort as a, uh, as a working group, I believe, yes, it's a working group of RDA. Hillary already explained how those working groups function and we again welcome people to join that effort. Um, so um, uh, the focus for our members in what, you know, we encourage our members to sort of character, uh, be characterized by is uh, that they, you know, essentially have strong performance in areas of capture and storage of data, curation, long-term preservation, discovery, access and retrieval of data, aggregation analysis or visualization, uh, you know, services and associated legal frameworks. So this is what we look to our members to perform. Um, and we currently have 86 regular members uh, who have been certified by the core trust seal certification 
We are providing a training for that certification on the 24th of February. I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but those are members like uh, my data center, the NASA CDAC and all the NASA DACs. We'll be hearing from Stephen Tanner a little bit later from NSIDC, another NASA DAC uh, about work that he's doing. And so this, um, these members have all essentially it, you know, shown that they wish to adhere to this sort of high benchmark. It's not the very highest benchmark, uh, but it is a very strong benchmark that says these, these um, data centers are, are adhering to best practices. Um, this is particularly important in an era where trust in, in, in sort of truth, the post-truth era, where trust in data really has to be established. We have other members, including networks such as the GNSS and um, uh, groups in the NERC uh, network uh, in the UK, ESDIS, which is um, uh, the Earth Science Data and Information System of NASA, et cetera, our network members, and we have partners, RDA, uh, associate members, um, ESIP, many other groups. You see the acronyms all around here. Um, we are trying, as I mentioned, to fill in some of the gaps in this map. So we are tending to be, because of the legacy of the World Data Centers upon which the World Data System started, uh, it, we are starting to basically um, grow out this map and encourage membership in many other regions of the world where currently there's a lack of representation. So that includes Latin America and Africa and parts of uh, South Asia. Um, these are some of the disciplinary areas. Again, the legacy was heavily earth sciences, but we now have World Data Center members that are representing uh, many other disciplines. Uh, the way you become a member is to first express your interest, and uh, that's a simple email to Rory, and then you go through the Core Trust Seal um, certification process, agree to the WDS bylaws, you sign an MOU or a letter of agreement, and basically uh, every three years you, you become renewed by updating your Core Trust Seal certification. It's a very uh, straightforward process. We do have a new category called candidate members, uh, and those are all um, um, uh, in, in the process of basically becoming members. So do contact Rory Edmonds if you're interested in that. Uh, I'm going to skip through some of these working groups because uh, I am running out of time and I don't want to take up other people's times, but we have quite a number of working groups that are working on different areas ranging from science to different data related uh, activities and uh, focusing on international data infrastructure. So um, I will wrap up um, and mention also Data Together, which is a, an effort under uh, well, it's not under any organization, but it's between CoData, RDA, GoFair, and WDS uh, to basically bring together the primary actors in the data ecosystem space uh, globally and to work together to further mutual goals. And finally, I'll just mention on the 24th of February, we are planning a training on the core trust seal certification process that Rory Edmonds and some others will be leading. And so we strongly encourage you to join that if you are interested in learning about uh, best practices in, in data center management. And with that, I close and thank you very much. Back to you, Madam Chair. Oh, thank you. I've never been called Madam Chair before. Uh, thank you so much. And if I may sum up what you said, WDS, and I wrote the keywords, is about trustworthy data services to build up a global research data infrastructure. And uh, we'll talk more about that uh, on the next uh, session on the 24th of February. But right now, let's start uh, the second panel of the day, which will be about scientific data management on health and the environment. And again, if you want to send questions, you can send them by email in Portuguese or in English. Okay, so let's start with this panel by inviting, oh, I have to look at the program, Ingrid Dillo, who is part of the RDA Council, but she's also the Deputy Director of the Dutch National Center of Expertise and Repository for Research Data. Ingrid Dillo 
is a historian, but she's an expert on scientific data management. So please, Ingrid, the floor is yours. And don't forget your microphone. And you, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you. That's perfect. Wonderful. So first of all, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Claudia. And a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really very honored to be able um, to speak to you today, to have this opportunity and to talk um, about an initiative um, that was taken by the RDA in um, the context of the COVID pandemic. And now I just need to figure out how I move my slide deck, which is not working at the moment. So just a moment. Ingrid, please double click in your slide, yeah. I think it moved, right? Perfect. So um, early spring, spring um, of last year, so almost a year ago, um, the European Commission in Europe approached the Research Data Alliance with a call to action. The Commission um, wanted to use the forum function of the Research Data Alliance to bring an international community of experts together. And with that, um, the RDA responded um, with the creation of a fast track working group. Now this working group was not to be tied to the normal processes within RDA because usually groups work uh, for 12 to 18 months to deliver an output. But in view of the pandemic, um, the results that were needed um, had to be there much faster, of course. And this uh, working group was really a fast track one. And it, uh, the aim of it was to come with recommendations and guidelines on data sharing in public health emergencies. So these recommendations uh, were mainly focused um, at policymakers and funders um, to maximize um, the timely and, and um, high quality data sharing in response to COVID. And um, the guidelines um, that had to be quite detailed were focused um, on researchers and data stewards to help them um, in their daily work and to progress um, data sharing. So this was really a community effort. Um, when we launched this initiative, we had around 600 people registering and volunteering, both from within the RDA community, but also a lot of people outside of um, the RDA. And in the end of those 600 people, around 160 really became active contributors to the documents that we produced. And there were experts in different fields that moderated the different subgroups, and I'll get to that. But we had even wider engagement because we also tried to organize weekly, weekly webinars open for everybody. And we also had continuous requests for comments open on um, the different versions of documents. And all of this was very much um, according to the guiding principles of RDA of openness, of inclusiveness, a community drivenness and um, consensus building. So um, I said 600 participants, so that was a really large community. And of course that community also had a lot of experience and expertise and that provided for us an excellent opportunity to turn this in a really collaborative and cross-disciplinary effort. Um, so we defined four different research areas that we looked at, clinical data, omics, epidemiology and social sciences. And we also defined four more cross-cutting important themes, community participation, research software, indigenous data guidelines, and legal and ethical considerations, which are of course also very important in the context of um, data sharing in health. Um, the actual work was done in many different teams. So for all of those research areas and cross-cutting themes, we had um, teams working um, um, and that were led by, by moderators with a lot of, of, of expert um, experience in that particular field. 
But next to those, there were also teams to take care of visualizations of um, the editing of all the materials. Um, there was a team that created a Zotero library that documented all the underlying resources, etc. So all in all, we did this, um, this work in three months. Um, uh, and that three months um, saw continuous prints and consultations and different releases of, of um, the recommendations and guidelines. And in the end, we had a document of over 140 pages of recommendations and, and um, guidelines. And on this slide, you see a couple of references. So next to those recommendations and guidelines, we also had other outputs like an infographic, um, the library that I mentioned, and a couple of navigation tools to go through the materials. Um, and we also um, created a policy brief for funders with a specific focus on those recommendations that are really relevant for that stakeholder group. So what was the challenge uh, that we uh, were facing? And I'm sure that you all are all very aware of, of uh, the one. Um, the point of, of course is that we need to create a kind of trade-off, I think, between on the one hand, the critical need to share data as soon as possible um, in the COVID situation. And on the other hand, also the notion that we need to guarantee the quality of the data, which is equally important. So it's all about, you know, striking the right balance between timeliness and, and um, precision. And next to that, we also know that um, the massive um, research response to COVID also, of course, challenges the interoperability of the data, not only over the different disciplines that um, are critical to solve these issues, but also be between countries, between different infrastructures. So we are confronted with the fact that we still lack a lot of harmonized uh, standards and systems and sharing agreements. So those really were the challenges and still are the challenges that we are faced with, I think, in research. So what did we try to do? Again, um, create those detailed guidelines um, in order to help um, the researchers to maximize the efficiency of their research. And we also, of course, hope to create that in that way, a kind of blueprint that could be used um, in a wider context. Next to that, the recommendations for funders and policymakers. And so um, really trying to address all the interests of the different stakeholders involved. And we hope that this also, of course, will contribute um, to the more global effort or, that is currently undertaken by many organizations um, to raise the bar for data sharing. So here you see an overview of the 10 um, key recommendations from the report. And you will see um, if you um, maybe have time later on to really go through the slides um, that those recommendations are not only relevant for data sharing, I think, in public health emergencies like we are experiencing now. They have a much wider relevance. So, for example, um, the recommendation um, to use data management plans or a recommendation about the use of trustworthy digital repositories or um, the encouragement um, to make your data as openly available as possible as a kind of default. All of these recommendations are very, um, are, are very um, relevant in um, the context of COVID, but have a far wider um, relevance and could have a far wider impact. And they also um, apply to multiple stakeholders. So, for example, if you look at a recommendation three about investments, of course, that is one that is mainly aimed at funders. If you look at recommendation six, which is about um, the use of a um, domain specific metadata schema and persistent identifiers, that is, of course, also aimed at researchers. So it's, a, it's I think, a very rich uh, palette of, of recommendations um, for many stakeholders involved. Um, if you look at the um, grant level of granularity of the guidelines, um, they really differ from the recommendations. 
The guidelines are meant for researchers and they need to be therefore very detailed and also very practical. So I'd like to give you one example um, from the omics field. Um, if you talk about securing the long-term preservation of data and the future accessibility of data, um, the suggestion, the recommendation for funders and policymakers says that they need to promote the use of trustworthy data repositories full stop. But if you go to the um, detailed guidelines that we have in the omics section, there you will see that in that context, those guidelines go uh, are much more practical and detailed. Here, suggestions are given for certain repositories to be used for certain types of data. And you see there is also a direct link to the, the, the underlying resources and the databases and repositories um, that are mentioned. So um, a different level and granularity uh, with the guidelines. So um, what could be the impact and what do we hope the impact of all of this work um, in this COVID initiative could be? I think the first element deals with quality and quantity. We hope uh, quantity. We hope that this work really um, leads to more uh, reusable and reproducible um, research outputs and in that way also to better science. And then there is the element of speed. We hope that this work will also lead to more efficient ways to build on research outcomes and thus create faster solutions um, for the challenges that we have in front of us. And then there is the element of efficiency. Increased data sharing um, will hopefully lead to a better return on the investment or funded research. And finally, we also hope that the recommendations and guidelines will have an impact not only now and for the COVID situation, uh, but um, also um, for different uh, disciplines and over time because they are quite generic. Um, we are also um, having a couple of um, further ongoing actions um, running at the moment. Um, of course, we are still um, disseminating actively these guidelines um, to and um, recommendations to researchers and funders. Um, we are also um, looking to see whether these guidelines can be embedded in the data management um, principles for um, research on infectious diseases, of course. And um, in line with that, um, we are creating within RDA a new um, infectious diseases community of practice as an outcome also and a follow up of this work. And that community of practice will provide an opportunity to, to discuss and coordinate and provide knowledge and skills uh, within this discipline. Also working with others outside of RDA. So for instance, in this case, we will also be working um, with a big network of research funders in the area of infectious diseases. And finally, um, we will have um, a paper out, a, a group of people that were active in, in this initiative work together on a paper um, that describes the community participation in the, this whole endeavor. So as you can see, um, the core of the work is done, but still a lot of strands um, um, are um, um, in action and we really are still working on disseminating um, this, uh, the results, the outputs of this work. And I think here I will stop because I've used my time. So thank you very much and I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, let me now call Mauricio Barreto, who is a, a medical doctor, uh, but he's a professor of Federal de Bahia in Brazil and also a member of the Brazilian Academy of Science and the Medical Academy of Sciences in Brazil, and is going to talk a little bit about this huge health data infrastructure and data management system that he heads initiative in, in Brazil. Mauricio, there you go. Okay, sorry, I pressed a lot of buttons here too. Okay, are you sharing my, my presentation, Claudia? 
Yes, that's perfect. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank Claudia Faperspi, RDA, and the, the, the promoter, the Brazilian Academy of Science, yeah, for, for this uh, fantastic meeting and to give me the opportunity to talk about uh, some challenges and some problems related with the health data. Uh, I'm not a, a data specialist. Yeah, I'm a doctor, a medical doctor, an epidemiologist. Yeah, and do research in epidemiology. But in the past few years, I've been involved uh, in using the large Brazilian data set. Yeah, to try to uh, help produce and produce epidemiological knowledge. Yeah. Uh, that it could be shared with the Brazilian society and internationally. And in this process, you have accumulated a lot of uh, questions uh, and the how to use uh, this data, the uh, healthy data, the difficult, the challenge, yeah. And some of the challenges are very general. Uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, colleagues that uh, came before me have put some of uh, these big challenges. But there is other challenges, yeah, uh, specific uh, for health, yeah, that in my the, the previous speaker have in some way you know, introduced this idea that I'd like to develop a bit further. Yeah? Then uh, when you 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 work with this large data set in health, yeah, you have a lot of different problems, yeah, that is common yeah, for different areas of data management, yeah. And certainly you can share this experience with uh, different disciplines and different uh, uh, develop, uh, using uh, common development in different areas. But I, I, I'd like to put uh, uh, the first big challenge in the health data is in general, the, the, the health data for health research, they are based on individual data. Now you can use the other level of aggregation of data. This is possible. It's part of the, 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 the some branches of the health science. But in general, they are individual data. Now data on the individual. Now. And when you talk about the existence of data about the individuals, now, these data are fragmented, now, extremely fragmented yeah, in different silos. Yeah. And even the healthy data, uh, the healthy data of our press on our day, it exists in different silos, uh, in different uh, institutions, in different databases. Yeah, that uh, to 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 advance in terms of uh, research, the a big first big challenge is to integrate this data uh, around the, each individual. Uh, this idea was very well conceived in a, in a document from the National Academy of Science of the United States a few years ago, yeah? And the, this design uh, done is, is, was published in this publication, né? that you have different uh, levels of data that you needed to be integrated. This is uh, the big challenge. Then this generated a, a lot of specific challenges né? that the, in health research, you need to confront, yeah, to advance, yeah, steps. Now, and I'd like to stress, now, the the idea of it, the data handling in general, um, and the, the challenge on data management, the access, the quality, query, data sharing, etc. But there is a point that is on data privacy. Uh, then this data privacy is, is central uh, in this indoor this system that you change it completely, yeah, the 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 the, the relationship with your other uh, discipline that use data without uh, without the privacy concern. Yeah. And then uh, given the privacy concern, uh, the the uh, healthy researcher using that, this data needed to confront with the legal question. Uh, then is a, a big issue now. Yeah, the, the, the legal is not an easy question. Yeah, for for any doing that. Yeah, because you are you need to be inside the legal framework. Yeah, not to be illegal. Yeah, what you're doing. And the ethical frame. Now, uh, um, historically, the uh, uh, health research is very well controlled, yeah, by ethical, by an ethical process. Now. 
And then now, now in use of data, you mix a bit of the ethical né? and a bit of the legal concern. Né? And then there is now uh, in different countries, né? different legal né? structure, legal frames, laws and regulations that uh, give né? the, the frame where né? you need to stay when using data. Then this uh, take a lot of limitation. Né? Uh, a first limitation is concerned with, with data linkage. Né? If you if you integrate this data around the individual, uh, you need to link this data. Né? And then you have a lot of problem because if you link the data, you have to identify the individual in some in some stat. Now you need to know this person. They have all the data or several different data linked to this individual. Then this is a, a big challenge, né? uh, uh, the, the process of the linkage né? that you need to identify the point. Uh, limitation in data sharing, né? you saw uh, in this uh, pandemic, the current pandemic, né? that uh, all the time that big crisis come, yeah? Uh, there is this make it clear né, how uh, you need to advance in this question of data sharing. Né? When you think your data go out of a country, a healthy data, this is a huge problem, yeah, because the data cannot flow as other types of data. Then this is a, a big issue that you have been international, internationally discussed, but it's not yet, and it's far from being overcome. And uh, uh, this creating a lot of limitation on data access, given the control mechanism that need to be developed. Né? They need to create a special mechanism to control the data. Yeah, and this should need the uh, management, the more complex infrastructure, and the uh, resources yeah, that is not uh, uh, common in other areas. Né? Then only I got the legal frame, you know, I only can uh, sit here, yeah, to, to uh, people who work in data know well, né, the general data protection regulation from European, that they have, from Europe, that they have been a, a, a kind of reference, international reference in personal data use, you know, and it's very important for everyone. And in the case of Brazil, now you have a specific law that is now, uh, in effect, né, that is a law on protection of personal data. Né? The, the Brazilian parliament approved a few years ago at uh, this new law né, that was a lot inspired né, in the GDPR, yeah, but with some specificities uh, related to the Brazilian situation. Then I'd like to uh, make in my few minutes that I have some consideration on the safe data linkage environment. Né? Then this is a, a big issue in health. Yeah? How to link the data with all the safeguards yeah, necessary yeah, to protect individuals and to do this in very much né? a safe environment yeah, to, to, to be according to the ethical principles and to legal né, procedures. Then I, uh, the, I, I refer to this paper that was published a few years ago that summarized you know, a, a bit of this process you know, that you have a different stage, yeah? If it's data access approval, you, know, you need a lot of approvals on each set of the data you know, to, be, to be connected or to be linked in, in the process. The data, each of these databases need to be Né, accepted the, uh, the, 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 the session of the database by the, the provider or the owner of the database, yeah. The ethical uh, uh, approvals uh, and the, the, to be according to the legal uh, frame that uh, are you based on. Uh, a, a lot of it, uh, you need to train your research to, to use that, yeah, and require from the researcher, the user, né, a lot of it, uh, characteristic training capacity responsibility because the part of the process yeah is 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 uh, uh, related to requirements né, related to the research and uh, you need some uh, care on the physical virtual setting yeah to be 
according yeah and to be appropriated to do in 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 safety and in high level of privacy yeah to to process this 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 data yeah? and then uh, uh there is a need yeah, of, of a lot of control procedures a lot of protection of the data yeah? that is not uh, so uh, necessary yeah when uh, the work is done with data that's not related with individuals or, or, or data that are not so don't need so this level of protection now only to to say claudia i i'm this experience was developed here in the center now the center of data knowledge integration for health that is a center uh, uh link linked with Fio Cruz in, in Salvador, Bahia, where you have tried to use it. And the Brazilian database, the large Brazilian database, yeah, with the agreement of the Ministry of Health, you know, the other governmental agency with the ethical approval inside the Brazilian legal framework, yeah, to try to build you know, a data platform, yeah, that can, a yeah, couple, okay, can uh, be capable you know, to, to account yeah, and the capable to work with the, the different issues that related with the use of, of healthy data in context of Brazil. Now you have done a lot of different kind of linkages that created the, uh, a different structure that you call, uh, for example, uh, the 100 million Brazilian cohort that involves more than 100 million Brazilians, yeah, linked data. Uh, a, 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 a burst a, a co, co, cohort, yeah, that you also uh, using some different, yeah, databases from the Brazilian system, yeah. And you see here a list of these huge databases that uh, we are using, uh, is 27 million, 200 million, 100 million. And this generated uh, all these, the challenges that uh, I talked before. Uh, grow uh, in the moment that you have a very large data set that needed to be treated, processed in this so protected environment, yeah, to to protect the the privacy and to be according to ethical principles. Uh, and but one important thing that is the objective of the center is to to show that you are capable uh, using this data to produce knowledge that will be very useful né, to understand the health problems in Brazil. Né? And then you have here example of a list of uh, publication né, that came né, from this process of data integration that is done in CIDAC. Né, and now it starts to, to be possible to produce it né, in association with the research from Brazil and in uh, from other uh, countries, uh, you have been capable to produce you know, important knowledge that the heavy scientific global interest, yeah, and also uh, to the Brazilian health system in terms of the, uh, um, uh, solve some of the questions that exist inside the system. Then, thank you very much and uh, for the opportunity to give this talk. Thank you, Mauricio. We had two speakers on health data, and now we're going to have two speakers on environmental data. And we'll start with Steve Tanner, who is a researcher at the National Snow and Ice Data Center in the United States. Steve, please start. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Tanner. I am with NASA's National Snow and Ice Data Center Distributed Active Archive Center, the NASA NSIDC DAC. And I know that's a lot of acronyms, but <clears throat> the acronyms are important because they, they, they mean something, especially relative to data sharing and uh, data use. Uh, NASA itself, as, as we all know, uh, collects a, a wealth of information globally, uh, environmental information uh, primarily. And almost all of that data, they are required to make available to the public. It's, it's basically built into the infrastructure of how data is collected for NASA. Uh, 
and they make all of the data that's, that's publicly available free and open access to everyone that wants it. Um, there are strict timelines for when a principal investigator collects data and when they have to make it available uh, if it's funded by NASA. Usually it's about six months and that six months is to be used for quality control and uh, uh, trying to get the data in a state that's uh, sustainable going forward with it. Uh, there's usually data management plans associated with projects and, and things like that. So NASA has data sharing built into the generation of the measurements that uh, uh, PIs go out and take. Uh, and that leads to the other two acronyms, the NSIDC and the uh, DAC portion. The mechanism that NASA uses to make this data available is primarily through the DACs. Uh, NSIDC being one of them, Alex had mentioned the other one up at Columbia. There's about a dozen or so different DACs around that NASA supports. Uh, each one typically concentrates on a specific area. Sorry, could you please tell us what DACs means? Yeah, so DAC is the acronym for the uh, Distributed Active Archive Center. And so the DACs are the, the physical locations where NASA stores and makes available most of the data uh, that they make public, uh, or science data, I should say. Um, and uh, uh, each of these DACs typically concentrates on a specific area like the carbon cycle or atmospheric data. NSIDC concentrates on the cryosphere which is the cold, snowy regions of the world, uh, Antarctica, the Arctic, that sort of thing. Um, and so why am I here talking to, to you guys about the snow and ice data? Uh, well, it's because the data has a wider range of uses than is the, the primary focus might have, have yielded. So for example, NASA launched a satellite in 2018 called ICE Satellite 2, ICE Sat 2. And it's a polar orbiting satellite uh, that's primarily looking at sea ice and land ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic. But it's a satellite. And so it's going over the entire Earth. And while it's going over uh, the rest of it, it's collecting data uh, around there too. And so we host that data as well. Um, and so all of that data is, uh, is available to you. So. Um, Relative to ISAT2, what, what does that mean? What is ISAT2 and what is the data that they're gathering? Well, ISAT2 is a LIDAR uh, laser-based altimeter. And what that means is it's shooting photons down at the Earth and then measuring how long it takes the photon to come back up to the satellite. What that allows you to do is very precisely measure the height of whatever you're passing over. Again, the focus for ISAT-2 was measuring the height of the ice, but it also measures the height of trees, buildings, water, uh, and there is some penetration uh, capabilities of the, uh, of the photons into water so that you can actually get some bathymetry data, meaning the, uh, the surfaces underneath the water. So if you're a coastal nation or if you have a lot of inland waterways, there's a lot of data here that uh, can be useful to you or if you have forest and uh, agriculture areas, the uh, tree canopy height information could be quite useful to you. So, um, so that kind of thing is, is what ISAT2 is, is making available. And again, NASA uh, concentrates on making all of this data publicly available to the world. So, so far, ISAT2 was launched in 2018. We have about 93 different countries that are coming in and uh, using the data thus far. Um, and one of the keys with ISAT-2 in particular is it passes over the exact same orbits every 91 days. So that means it's gathering data over your area of interest four times a year or once a season. So that means that four times a year, every season, you can see what the heights are around you of your agriculture, your water, uh, everything else that is passing over. And it's all available and you can come and get it and it's free. And so how, you might ask, does NASA uh, set up and, and try to work on this uh, data sharing capabilities? And there are a number of user interfaces and a lot of metadata that uh, typically gets gathered when NASA is trying to make data public and available. Um, one of the primary search tools that they have available is a search tool called Earth Data Search. 
And this is a search mechanism that lets you look for all of NASA's Earth data holdings at all of the DACs. Uh, so it's a good way to get a blanket look at all of the data available. Uh, Alex had mentioned Oak Ridge, there's data at Oak Ridge, there's data at Columbia, there's data at, at all of the DACs across the United States. Now, if you come to NSIDC in particular, looking for data like ISET2, um, each data product has a landing page available publicly on the web where we provide you with all of the information we know about that particular data product. So we have user guides associated with it. We often have what's called uh, an algorithm theoretical basis document, which is a document that the principal investigator themselves wrote about how they collected the data, how they produced the data, uh, the formats of it, and how you might use the data. Um, there's uh, temporal and spatial filters for filtering out the, the pieces that you want. There's just a, there's a lot of information on the landing pages to help you find the data that you want and how to use that data. Uh, in addition to that, if you already know the data that you want to come and get, there are APIs available. These are uh, programmatic means to come in and get the data so that you can write your computer programs, your scripting, uh, those sorts of things to come in and automate getting the data. I had mentioned with ISET2, it's passing over the same area every uh, four times a year, every 91 days. You might wanna set up a program that constantly goes in and, and gathers the data up uh, as it's coming in periodically like that. Um, we also curate a suite of uh, Python uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, and a GitHub repository of code that people outside of NS uh, NSIDC have generated. So these are researchers that have developed code for using the data that we feel like might be useful to the wider community. And so we're curating uh, notebooks and a GitHub repository for that kind of information. And if you guys, have developed uh, such uh, code and stuff, bring it to us and, and let us know about it. And we may want to uh, make it available as well. So we have the landing pages, we have the search mechanisms, we have the, uh, the uh, programmatic access to the data. We have all of these capabilities to get the data. But what happens if you still have questions? Uh, you're, you're trying to use this data and you're still not quite getting it. So all of the DACs, but NSIDC, uh, the DAC that I am at, has a user services staff that's set up specifically to help you work with the data, to help you use the data and to answer questions that you have. And if you stump them, if they can't answer your question, at NSIDC, we have a, a research staff, we have a, a science team, and the user services guys will go and ask the science team. And if they can't answer it, we will reach out to the principal investigators or the uh, mission project office itself and try to get your questions answered. So everyone that I just mentioned, the user services, the PIs, the project office, they all want you to use this data. It's important for them to use it and, and for selfish reasons. If you use, for example, ISAT2 data and get a lot of use out of it, they'll let us launch ISAT3. And so we have a vested interest in you guys uh, coming and getting that. Uh, and in addition to, to using the data, NASA is also trying to do a lot of uh, outreach with uh, researchers. So uh, the co-author on uh, this, this presentation is Sabrina Delgado Arias is responsible for a program called the Early Adopter Program for using ISAT2 data. And she has gone out across the, uh, the world making presentations on the data and trying to get users, uh, researchers interested or understanding what they can use the data for. Uh, and so we had an example of that in our paper that uh, Professor Rodrigo Piva out of uh, Brazil had done looking at using ISAT2 data to look at the uh, bathymetry in uh, rivers uh, there. And so that's just an example of the, the type of activity that goes on there. So the upshot is, NASA is making concerted efforts to make all of their data publicly available in a very timely way and provide you guys with access and with access to personnel that can help you with any problems that you run into. So please come in and take a look at that and use uh, the data that we have and ask us any questions that you have. And with that, I will give the floor back to, to you, Claudia. Thank you, that's a dangerous invitation because I like asking silly questions. 
So now let's go to the last presentation of this panel to go then to questions. And I'd like to invite Professor Pedro Luis Pizigati Correia, uh, who is a professor of computer science at the University of Sao Paulo. Pedro, thank you for sharing your experience with us. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, I will start my presentation here. Just make one, two or three seconds to make sure that my slide is okay. Okay. Slide here, just a moment. Okay. While you were checking our slides, we already okay. have lots of questions and I, you can ask questions in Portuguese or English. Email is science at fapes.br. Okay, Pedro, sorry. Thank you, Claudia, for this invitation. Thank you, Rory, for this invitation too, Rory for WDS. This is a very nice opportunity to discuss about the challenges and the, to build uh, the infrastructure for e-science in Latin American Caribbean. Um, um, my our area is computer science, but I would like to talk about the, the challenges that you have uh, faced with the project that you are involved in here. It's about the Parsec. Parsec is building new tools for the data sharing and reuse through a transnational investigation of socioeconomic impacts of protected areas. So uh, the Parsec project is uh, the, the, uh, the, the main objective of Parsec project is to reuse data. We are considered to reuse data. We are working to uh, produce predict of uh, socioeconomic outcomes of natural protected areas on rural uh, communities using a novel combination of satellite imagery and artificial intelligence. You are improve uh, the future of environmental decision make. This is the one important um, objective of our project. And uh, you are increased the number of citations of data sets and better attributes than to the data creators. So this project is, uh, this is the main uh, objective of this project. One important thing to talk about this project, this project is uh, a Belmont Forum project. Belmont Forum project is uh, a, a, a forum of uh, funders, science funders, national science funders in the world. And uh, this project has this mission to, to build uh, these objectives. So the, the, this project has two strands. One strand is related with the synthesis. The synthesis is related to build this model. And the, another strand is related with data science strand. We are working to develop best practices. We are going to develop some tools to support uh, data reuse uh, infrastructure. So uh, the countries that are participating, participant countries in this project is Brazil uh, by FAPESP, uh, France by ANR, Japan with JST, and United States with National Science Foundation. So you have partners from INSI, INSI from Australia and BGS from UK. And uh, this project has some organization associated with collaboration with D Data Site, ORCID, EZIP, RDA, EDI, WDS, AST, JWP, and TNC. So uh, let's talk about the challenges and the uh, when you're talking about synthesis. This project has some uh, some very uh, uh, restricted, we are using data 
and uh, we are combining data from socioeconomic data and satellite imaging. So one first uh, challenge that we have in this project is related with reproducibility. Reproducibility in some strategic papers, for example, since in the last papers we have some problems to, for example, from, from acquire images from satellite images, from Google images. So there is some lack related with uh, scripts. There's no, sometimes you don't, you don't have scripts uh, available uh, for reproducing these papers. Uh, this is one important thing that I would like to talk about. The reproducibility is a, is a real, really problem that you have yet. Another, uh, uh, when you're talking about this project in the synthesis project, we have we are another challenge in this project is related with the uh, data we are working with. We we are reusing data a different data set we are working this project. For example, you are working with satellite images, you are working with images and uh, with socioeconomic data. They are input for our models and uh, you are creating uh, predicted socioeconomic indicators. So the, 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 the first challenge that we have is the integration of this data. There are some challenges related with granularity of this, the, image with the socioeconomic data. For socioeconomic data, for example, part of this data will have a, a get from uh, local uh, socioeconomic data like Brazil, we have a census. The census is uh, almost 10 years and uh, they'll have uh, some uh, problems with the uh, fine, uh, the integration considering with, with the granularity and, and time space uh, problem with integration. Uh, what kind of data that we have? Uh, for input data, we are using ground through data. We are using local surveys, like in Brazil, you are using, for example, data from IBGE, Institute, Brazilian Institute for Geographic, and uh, you are using satellite images. And uh, the output is a uh, global graded socioeconomic information. And uh, this is our main output. Um, for the global socioeconomic data, we are using uh, uh, some global that database that aggregated some uh, national uh, data sets. For example, we are using uh, DHS and the data from New Zealand. So this data, there is no rest restriction for academic research and uh, we can download it, and, uh, but there is no DOI to reference this data. There is no digital object uh, identifier to reference this data. This is the same, that the same challenge that we have our work with, for example, for IBGE data, for example, or local, uh, local survey. For satellite images, um, we are working with Google, we are using uh, ImageNet, uh, so we have uh, different sources, uh, so there are some uh, challenges related with usability, uh, challenges related with uh, some, this database is not free. So this is the one challenge that we have when access satellite image. Uh, one output important of our project, you are, uh, we are uh, deploy a grid map with indicate socioeconomic indicators close to protect area. So this is one important uh, output of our project. And uh, for example, we developed a study case in Brazil related with Vale do Ribeira. Vale do Ribeira is a, a region here in Brazil that we have a lot of protect areas. It's a very studied area here, most in project in FAPESC are related with this area. Uh, this area is a, 
they have a lot, uh, they have some uh, challenges related with socioeconomic challenges in this area. So this is important area to study. So uh, here, for example, we developed the same methodology just to uh, in, the, in the beginning of the project. So we produce, we produce some indicators. These indicators would produce it using some data from uh, Google, Google uh, satellite images. And we use our local survey, IBGE, for socioeconomic data. And uh, we produce some indicators for this area, indicators related with income, uh, indicators about the longevity and education. So one another output of this project is related with the uh, data science strength. At another data science strength, we are giving some, um, some outputs that could be used for Belmont in general. So this project is helping Bel Belmont to build uh, uh, I'm managing, uh, give some directions about the data management. So one important thing when you're talking about data reuse is to use some workbook. The workbook during the, the, uh, during the, the, the data reuse, we can produce a checklist for uh, about the uh, data provenance, about the data reference. So this is a very important thing that we are applying in our project. In this project, we have some challenges related with, uh, we are working for, for diff we are building models for different countries. We are working with people, researchers from different countries. Uh, we have different funders. We have uh, different languages. So the approach for uh, digital object management planning is important to this kind of project. For example, we have some very simple solution for, for managing, for example, temporary storage. You are using Google Drive, for example. We are using some infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, like uh, Amazon Web Services, for example. Uh, for team communications, you are using email, of course, but we are using Slack is a very good uh, tool for team communication. For a hub, for uh, the, the hub for um, integrated, uh, the data integrated uh, documents and uh, support the, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of tools, you are using open science framework uh, OSF, it's a very interesting framework that we can integrate a different cloud infrastructure. We can integrate a different, uh, we can integrate with Slack. So this is very, integrate with GitHub too. So this is a very interesting hub to, that you are using in, in your project. For data preservation, you are using a repository for environmental data initiative. This is a data repository that you are deploy our data, our grid that you are produce, socioeconomic grid that you are producing your project. Uh, for uh, um, publications, uh, posters, uh, every digital document that produced during your project, we are using Zenodo. And uh, for training workshop, you are using the node too. This is material that you are producing in the, the in this project. Uh, the general recommendation for digital output management plan, uh, we have produced a document. This document is available. Uh, please feel free to, to check. And uh, this is a very interesting reference for using for data management planning or for a synthesis project. So special thanks for the, the team, Brazilian team, uh, Professor Katia, Jean-Pierre from INPI, uh, Gianetti, this is our postdoc in the, this project, uh, Solange from Cielo, and people from Ezauki. Uh, 
Um, we have some support uh, of researchers from IBGE too. Thank you, Nadia and Miguel. So thank you, Claudia. Thank you for this opportunity again. Thank you, Pedro, for this very interesting presentation. And now I'd like to ask everybody who's in this room to uh, show their faces because we're now having to, we'll start the question and answer. And I just like to present the famous Rory that was mentioned by several people, uh, at least I can see you say, Say hi, Rory, so people who are watching can see where you are. And Rory will be one of the leaders of uh, next uh, webinar in two weeks. And there is Elena Nader, and I cannot see Elena. Uh, Elena is the vice president of, of the Brazilian Academy of Science. And she's also present and may want to ask questions because she's in uh, research on medical data. Now, uh, summing up, this panel was divided in two parts. The first part talked about recommendations and challenges of sharing medical data. Uh, and the second part talked about the same uh, issues but concerning environmental data and uh, some of the keywords that i noticed that everybody used were problems of heterogeneity maintaining privacy depending on the kind of data but usability and also reproducibility okay and of course we'll continue now discussing i just like to let everybody who's listening live by YouTube will extend this to 20 minutes beyond the time because we started about 20 minutes late. Okay, so now I present again Professor Roberto Cesar, who is going to ask the questions <laughs> that we are receiving by email. Thank you, okay. Roberto. Thanks a lot, Claudia. So we received a number of questions. I'll try to group them into kind of common subjects so that Claudia might organize who is commenting what, okay? So there are three questions regarding actually um, data, making data available, uh, the impact of these into publishing papers, for instance, there is one question that says that eventually making publish, making data available is a way of improving the quality of publications, because of course there is lots of pressure in publishing things. There are these predatory uh, journals that are appearing uh, all the time, anywhere, everywhere. And then the question is that wouldn't this be a way of eventually uh, improving the quality of publications because, of course, if data is available, it's easier to, to analyze reproducibility and this kind of stuff. And uh, what would be the impact in this sense? Also, they ask, uh, related to this, if uh, what, what about uh, recognizing the contribution of people that make, paper, make uh, data available regarding mainly academic careers where in most fields we are, we are mostly measured by what we publish in terms of papers, but less in general regarding publishing um, data available. So this is related to the first, that's why I'm asking. And then there is a third question here that uh, says that, wouldn't these have a kind of negative feedback in the sense that Publishing data allows people doing meta-analysis, analysis of data that they were not involved in the experiments. And uh, would this kind of trend eventually um, kind of have a, a negative impact in the production of science in the sense that there are, will be more people doing analysis of data instead of doing the experiments and producing the data, et cetera. So these kind of three questions are related to data, papers, 
and the quality of this kind of interaction between the two. You are muted, Claudia, you are muted. Oh, thank you, Roberto. Um, I, I'd like to start by the last one because uh, lots of people talk about the benefits and lots of people talk about the dangers of, of uh, sharing data, but uh, I've, it's not so common to see someone considering a danger that too many people will want to use the data. So who would, I mean, the more people use the data, the better for science. Uh, that's my point of view. So from the panelists, does anyone want to uh, answer? And Alex and Hillary, please um, contribute if you, if you want to say something. Who volunteers? Robert, you can also volunteer, okay? Ingrid, Ingrid. Maybe, maybe I'll start. Um, so I think um, um, that this has a lot to do with trust. And I think trust is a very important concept when we talk about data sharing. So in order to make this work, we need trust with a lot in a lot of in all the steps of the process in, in, a, in a way and with all the stakeholders involved. So this means that, for example, someone who deposits data needs to be sure that the repository takes good care of that data. Someone who reuses the data from a repository who has not been involved in the process of gen generating these data, they need to be sure that the data, you know, are not um, 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 compromised in any way. So there needs to be trust that the repository handles it right. It, there needs to be trust in a sense that the reuser needs to have a certain confidence in the qualities of the, the generator of the data. And we need to find mechanisms to ensure that trust and to make that the trustworthiness visible in a way. So this has to do, um, you know, with, with um, um, training researchers um, also in the area of scientific integrity in making sure that we have requirements with which we can um, test the repositories that hold the data. Um, so we need to create trust in the whole chain. And, and if we are able to do that, I think um, those doubts that people have in, you know, saying um, these data were not created by myself, so I can't trust them, or, you know, people being scared that their data are used by many people and they don't have control over what people do with that. We need to build in those mechanisms to create trust to, to um, make that um, something um, of the past. That would be my initial reaction to this comment. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so, I like it. oh, yeah. Go ahead, Maurice. I'm sorry. It's just I cannot see everything sorry, at the sorry. same time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd like to add, yeah, uh, at least in the in the in the area of the uh, the health research, I think you have a, a problem, and uh, that in general the, the the famous experiment in the health research is a very limited experiment. Now uh, the the health research cover a very very. Uh, uh, limited the population né? that in general uh, uh, very good research sometimes but you cannot generalize the results i think this is a big issue in in the health research yeah to make it generic statements yeah about the uh, same question i think important meta-analysis were developed to use it in the health research to compensate that but I think the access to the data, né, or a more broad uh, amount of data, yeah, from different contacts, can create a more uh, new possibilities of, of making more uh, results of the, the, the health research more generic, more generalizable, yeah, more policy oriented, yeah, knowledge. Yeah, there is a lot of things, yeah, beyond the reproducibility. I think reproducibility is important, but there is another, uh, several other elements that uh, add value for these efforts. 
sure that uh, uh, this question of the, the, the health service patient has, the, I produce my own data. This is, is, a, is a question that is uh, marketing the, the, the scientific development, but this is not more, yeah? There is no more consistency in the, in the thing, yeah? Because it, if you want to test a hypothesis and you have the, the data already collected as the hypothesis, the, uh, there is no problem that you use the, the data that already exists. This is cheaper, yeah, take it uh, shorter to you to answer, yeah? And it, there is a lot of your advantage. And you see in different fields of science. For example, when the, the uh, Ingrid talk here about the genomic research, but the genomic research in terms of health application only are advanced, yeah, when they put together the data of big studies, yeah, population-based studies with the, the genomic data. Now, when put integrated this data, like the, the, the genomic bank in, in UK, others initiatives, one million genomics in the US, uh, something similar in China, yeah, then this creates huge databases capable to answer, yeah? very complex question that is not possible with limited yeah, experiments. Then I think there is a lot of advantage yeah, that uh, make the, the use of uh, data, yeah, healthy data yeah, for on the benefit of the society. And I'd like to stress that it's not, not on benefit of the researcher, it's benefit of the society, of the, 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 the individuals, of uh, improve the policy oriented in knowledge yeah then this i think an uh, important point in my view yeah to stress the value of this this kind of uh, use and the use of this large database thank you mauricio and you also answered a little bit of the first question on publications and and so on steve uh could you uh Try to answer all the questions, if you can, like a little bit of each, uh, on, on, you know, advantages of publication uh, together with data. Sure. Uh, benefit one's career, okay? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, on that third question, the, the negative impacts, I will say uh, for us, I had mentioned that we have a user services group, and very often users uh, of the data will ask questions about it that reveal some, some nuances of the data that the original PI had not thought of. So it actually makes the data more understandable. Now, these are data sets that are quite large, and so it may be that the PI can't look at every single piece of the data that's coming in. For example, with ISAT2, it's a terabyte of data a day. And so they're not going to be able to, to comb over every square inch of it. And so getting user users finding stuff in the data actually makes the data better. Uh, relative to the, the competition coming out of it, I, I've seen more of the opposite where they end up collaborating. You know, hey, I thought of this other idea with the data and that ends up leading to new areas of research more than shutting things off, at least in my anecdotal experience with that. Um, as to the other two uh, questions, uh, the first one was, are publications stronger and better when they have access to the data? And I, I I didn't know that was a question. <laughs> I thought, yes, yes, it absolutely is better. Uh, and, and that is why NASA is trying to put the data out there so that everyone can include that in their research specifically to make their papers stronger and better by having access to more information. Uh, the second question is an interesting one about uh, the publications of data improving the careers of uh, researchers, uh, especially academic researchers. And, and that's a... That's a harder question because the, whoever asked the question is right and that the focus is typically on the number of publications. But data sources now are beginning to have a DOIs associated with them, uh, object identifiers with them. And the publications of journal articles typically have to have the data DOI associated with it. And I know there are some activities underway to look at the number of citations of those DOIs in papers. And some researchers and some research institutions are now beginning to include that uh, in the career analysis of, of their given researchers. I don't know how widespread that is, but I do know that it is beginning to happen. Uh, 
And that's one way of, of trying to get credit for the data that you have produced. And I, I hope that helps. Oh, yes, it does. Thank you. Pedro, would you like to compliment uh, on any of these issues? Uh, and Carlos, there is Hillary also wishing to speak. Oh, okay. Okay, Hillary. Uh, but I, I'll ask Pedro first because I'm the moderator and Hillary is outside the panel. So I'm sorry, Hillary. Pedro, would you like to compliment and then we, uh, Hillary will compliment? Uh, I, I just would like to compliment the discussion about the uh, data set citation. Uh, I think uh, it's important con to consider uh, the, uh, the institutions could recognize it, the data set productions, for example, the universities, for example, they could uh, uh, consider this is very important for researchers to uh, uh, consider to publish data in, this is a very important thing. Um, yes, uh, I think another very interesting thing that the data site is uh, improving the tools. So we have a lot of statistics about the data set, reuse it. So it's interesting to, uh, that we have a lot of uh, progress in this area. So I think it's, uh, we have a, a, a good, now you have a good infrastructure for data site. So for that data set uh, citation. So I think this is one thing that I'd like to add it. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Hillary. I'm sorry, I did not see your hand. Uh, please go ahead. It's fine, Claudia. I wanted to uh, go back to the point about the uh, recognition aspect, the second question. And uh, it's interesting because, um, I mean, the Research Data Alliance was involved in a, in a, a sort of a, an open science policy group for a good number of years, and they had a, a series of recommendations, and, and one of them was that we wouldn't advance on open science uh, if we weren't able to support this rewards and recognition and incentivization aspect. And, um, and interestingly, though, it's slightly uh, beyond the uh, business as usual for the Research Data Alliance, we are helping to coordinate and drive this research uh, or the research assessment, if you like, like a registry, so that uh, different pilots and implementations and different um, incentives that are taking place in different, you know, funded by uh, or, or supported by different nations and organizations can be exposed and made available and, and analyzed so that that will help that aspect because it's clearly required from the uh, researchers and the academics and also needed, if you like, from, from, from the other side as well and from the funders. So um, it was a clear, I think, cry for help. It's difficult because I think there's a huge model. No one on this call would not know that, that there's a huge, you know, uh, cultural change required in it. But actually, Ingrid might know more, but the Dutch are very uh, advanced on that and have some really good um, examples of success with rewards and, uh, and incentives that are, you know, in not re re directly related to the publication. So I think it's, it's definitely going to improve in the future. Thank you, Hillary. We already have more questions. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll listen to the questions and then your idea for Hillary to in, uh, add more to this issue is great. And let's wait for the questions and see how we can manage this all. Thanks. Okay. So we, have, we have two more questions and they're specific to kind of the type of data, actually the type of the project. So I'm going to read them because uh, probably the panel may comment both on the specifics of these projects, but probably there are also some general les lessons that we can learn something. So I'm going to read the two since they're very specific. The first one is, Linea is hosting data repositories for the most important projects in astronomy. Uh, this mm -hmm. one, Digital Sky Survey and the Dark Energy Survey. 
We also apply to host data uh, for legacy survey of space and time. My question is, what are the benefits of joining RDA and WDS in our case? So this is the first thing. And the second, so on astronomy, and the second question regards biodiversity data. I work at Instituto Chico Mendes uh, for conservation biodiversity, and we are using Darwin Core standard format to guarantee biodiversity data sharing and inter Operability. This schema format is used around the world by environmental and scientific institutions. How this kind of standard format, the Darwin Core, fits on RDA and WDA principles and practices? Or it has to be in another schema from schema.org or made available, uh, some schema made available by you, RDA and WDA. So these are the two questions, Claudia. Uh, thank you, just to commenting on them. Um, they will be also answered at more length on the 24th of February. But uh, so I'd like to invite maybe Alex and Hillary to briefly answer these questions or Rory and Hillary about benefits, standardization, RDA, WDS. So I'm not a metadata expert. And um, what I can say is that Dublin Core is kind of a baseline minima, de minimis standard for metadata and uh, can be applied across multiple domains. And so I think that, um, uh, I'd rather not speak out of turn or you know provide misinformation, but I think it's a good starting point. And then you may want to get into some domain specific uh, metadata standards, for instance, for spatial data, ISO 19115 or the FGDC standards are, are good standards to use. I'm sure there's other domain specific standards that, that would be appropriate. And then, of course, you know, from there, the schema.org is essentially marking up metadata in a way that it can be readily searched using the Google uh, search tool. So, um, uh, what I can do, and I highly recommend, is that you get in touch with Rory or myself. If Rory, I don't know how we can communicate our email addresses on this um, uh, service on this on the webinar, but if if it's possible to communicate that to the participants, they should feel free to contact me or Rory, and we can uh, definitely engage Karen Payne, uh, the director of our international technology office, to answer a lot of these questions in more depth. Over to you, Claudia. Thank you, and Hillary, would you like? Oh, but you did not answer what's the advantages what's in it for me to join rda or in this the the specific question was from the astronomy group and a linear okay so why but not rda wds okay why would their repository join wds um I, i'm happy for rory uh since rory you haven't had an opportunity to talk why don't you just respond briefly if you don't mind to that question why would an astronomy data center wish to join wds okay yes i'm, I'm happy to do so so i i will freely admit that i am not um fully au fait with with the linear so I, I i sincerely apologize for that but i would um i would begin by by making the the, the strong point that um we actually already have a a, a number of the very important uh, astronomy data centers globally that are WDS members and the um, the IVOA, so the standards um, body for the virtual observatories, is also a network member of WDS and is strongly advocating that um, that the data centers underneath um, it, the, the, the the that standards body do do become regular members of WDS. So I think there's there's immediately a domain kind of um, a, a push that this is, is uh, something that is uh, useful and, and important to um, to astronomy uh, repositories. 
Um, but as regards kind of more generally, what, what would be the advantages of, of being part of WDS? I think the the, the, the first thing is that you, you really have um, an improved um, recognition that's not only on a local level, but an, an international level. Um, there is, you can heighten your profile. I mean, WDS is, is under the International Science Council, which is the largest uh, non-governmental scientific organization in the world. Um, and so from this, you, you get an increased visibility and engagement because you'd be more involved in the, the projects under ISC. Um, there is some proof that this can improve your funding prospects as well, and also your, your kind of recognition within your own host organization that you're, you're obviously in part of something bigger and more important. Um, there, uh, we've helped. Uh, by being part of WDS, we're facilitating interactions, data exchange, um, which might not be possible otherwise. You're really being more connected with the international community. Um, you're really to showing your commitment to open science. So you're you're showing your your adherence to our, our data sharing principles that were briefly shown by Alex. You're promoting your organisation as a as a trustworthy. A data repository by going through the core trust seal. Uh, you're improving your potential performance and agility by, um, because, you know, you're I really am so sort of sorry to interrupt you. Okay, yes. but this is all going to be seen also on the 24th. Somewhat, and we are maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah, but uh, we are getting more more questions. So if yes, you don't I mind. Yes, I uh, yeah, and the wisdom okay, of Hillary. There's myriad reasons. Sorry. Yes, there's billions of reasons. I'm so <laughs> sorry. You're talking about Japan. It's like 2 a.m. in Japan or whatever. Um, so, uh, Hillary, would you like to, or or maybe Ingrid, on the these um, RDA advantages, they are already pretty clear. But what about this metadata interoperability, which is, by the way, my area of research? Okay, but I don't want to answer. Okay, well, we let Ingrid answer that. Will we? Now I'm really getting scared, Claudia, the expert. Um, so maybe. Oh, no, Ingrid. Ingrid, please, please also mention the benefits uh, yeah, yeah. for well, research. I'd like to something about, about the metadata, because I think um, um, to the person um, asking this question, because I think, um, you know, on the one hand, we have very rich metadata schema, metadata standards for certain domains, like, for example, coming from the social sciences and humanities, I think of DDI, but for a lot of domains, there are specific metadata standards. Next to that, we have a couple of more generic metadata standards now. So you have the Dublin Core, I think that's the eldest. We have DCAT, we have schema.org, we have DataSide. So these are more generic. Uh, metadata schema, which have the advantage, of course, that they um, make it possible to share data and to integrate data over different disciplines, infrastructures, countries, etc. Um, so it's a kind of a, a trade off, you could say it's good to use um, those core uh, generic uh, standards. Um, so that you can bring different data together. Um, but, you know, if you have, for example, a social sciences data set using the DDI metadata schema um, creates more richness um, and provides lots more information. So you always need to think about why uh, you are using which metadata standard and repositories where you deposit your data can help you a researcher with choosing the right metadata um, schema, I think. Um, within RDA, um, there are several groups working in the area of metadata. So um, also from that perspective, it, it might be very interesting uh, for people to have um, a look at the work that's being done there. So I think, um, you know, RDA is um, um, all about um, building um, bridges and creating um, 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 ways to make sure that we overcome technical barriers and social barriers. So technical barriers, then we're talking about this interoperability issue, metadata, of, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So everyone who is interested in that area, independent of the domain that you come from, will find um, a material and activity of use to them, I'm sure. And maybe Hillary has to add something, wants to add something to that. 
Uh, just just to compliment, she mentioned how uh, you kind of give the benefit in the Netherlands for sharing data, how this can advance someone's career. Um, would you have examples or? Um, well, we um, our national funder, NWO, is quite far in, in, in designing policies to make sure that researchers get credit not only for the publications, but their, their academic career is also measured by other elements. So all the outputs that you produce in your research, be it code, software, um, be it um, um, a, a beautiful data set. Um, um, so our funder is um recognizing the importance of that and now we also have discussion with the research performing institutes to see how we can incorporate those elements also in the regular um, um how do you call that appraisals of of uh, the discussions of researchers so it really adds to their academic career but it's a tough process because you know these wheels turn slowly but I think we are already at the point that everyone acknowledges the importance of it. And now we're on our way to effectively implement that in the policies of all the stakeholders involved. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, we still have a few more uh, questions, but we'll answer them offline afterwards. And uh, we have um, about three more minutes to finish to keep within the two hour time limit. And I'll start by thanking all of you on behalf of the organizers who are ourselves up to a point, right? Because we have representatives from, from all the organizers. Uh, Rory pointed out to me earlier today that uh, this, uh, event was to take place in April 2020 and was canceled because of the pandemic. So we are not 20 minutes late. We are, we are one year and a half late in, in, in this event. And I'm so very glad that we were able to get all of you here and share your thoughts with us. Um, before I do the closing, um, I'd like to ask if any of you uh, panelists would like to add any comments, thoughts, remarks. No. Uh, and also pointing out one thing that I noticed as people were talking about metadata. This is the linkage problem Mauricio mentioned, right? Uh, you want to say something, um, Pedro? Uh, I think it's important when you're talking about uh, the South America, Caribbean, uh, it's important to have a collaboration. Collaboration for developing infrastructure, collaboration for developing policies. This is a very important, uh, very important uh, key uh, that we should approach between scientists, between policymakers. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Professor Elena Nader, Vice President of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, wants to say something. Very welcome, Elena. <laughs> well, I want to thank all of you. It was fantastic. As usual, I learned a lot. And uh, it's just to leave a message because I'm always concerned with all the discussion of open science, open data, and then comes open journals. If, how can we really improve that in undergraduate education? And I think we need to have these discussions in our universities, because I'm old, I'm leaving already. But the young students, we are not really showing them the importance of sharing. And that comes also with uh, as, uh, the, the 23rd agenda. It goes, it encompasses all this. So it's just to leave a message. How can we really, I think we should discuss this, improve open science education in 
all type of undergraduate as well, of course, graduate programs. And I want to thank Claudio and Mauricio, who are the, and Pedro, the Brazilian ones that are doing uh, this fantastic job in our country. Thank you so much. And all of you, of course. Thank you, Elena, and also for doing a fantastic job of leaving us with a new question, okay? Um, so uh, finishing, thank you very much to all of you who participated in, in this event. Thank you very much for the audience who are sending questions and who will contribute to uh, science in the world. And I'd like to advertise the next event on the 24th of February for three hours from nine to noon Brazilian time. And it will be a very big discussion and presentation on best practices on repository construction, management, and certification. And last but not least, I'd like to thank uh, all the FAPESP staff who are also present. There are six people present, invisible, but making this event available. Melete, Vera, Roberta, and three others whose name uh, I cannot see. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, please don't hesitate to send more questions to science at fapes.br that they will be answered by the experts. And now we'll close this session. And I just ask all the, those present uh, in the Zoom room to stay so we can say goodbye to each other and discuss a little bit more. Thank you and goodbye.